I believe the Citroën DS is one of France's greatest contribution to the modern world, up there with the metric system. The reason behind such a seemingly hyperbolic statement is simple. The DS is the single greatest evolutionary leap in automobile history that's been made between the end of World War II and the launch of the Tesla Model S in the third millennium. Its development lasted the best part of a decade, during which the Bureau d'Etudes Citroën, under the direction of André Lefebvre, pretty much reinvented the automobile one subsystem at a time. The Italian artist Flaminio Bertoni, who had designed the Traction Avant 20 years earlier, drew inspiration for the DS from aquatic creatures. The DS has no imposing front grille, and the only badge it wears is at the back, yet there's no mistaking it for anything else. Those lovingly sculpted panels carry no loads, as the car's structure hides beneath them. Its design was optimized for best weight distribution. Thick, sturdy steel box sections down low gradually become thinner and lighter as they reach the roof, which is a glass fiber panel screwed and bonded into place. The thin pillars, frameless side windows and wraparound front and rear screens give driver and passengers a nearly unobstructed view of their surroundings while enjoying an experience unlike any other car before. This type of construction was meant to facilitate styling updates, yet the DS appearance hardly changed over its nearly two decades on the market. The four headlights front end, introduced in 1967, could be considered the best restyling ever made in automobile history, as it brought the DS bang up to date and made it look perhaps better than ever. The DS engine-driven high-pressure hydraulic system assisted the steering, engaged and disengaged the clutch, empowered the brakes, activated by a mushroom-like pedal that responded to the force applied to it rather than pedal travel. But the key function of the high-pressure hydraulics was, of course, the self-leveling, height-adjustable hydropneumatic suspension. At the heart of the system are the so-called spheres, one per wheel acting as a suspension element and one as the system's main accumulator. The spheres are hollow steel balls open at the bottom, with a rubber membrane in the middle that creates two chambers. The top one is filled with nitrogen at high pressure. The bottom one is connected to the car's hydraulic circuit. The suspension works by means of a piston that forces oil into the sphere, compressing the nitrogen in the upper part of it, while the damping is achieved through a two-way valve placed at the bottom of the sphere itself. The result was a level of comfort and safety miles ahead of anything available in 1955 and arguably still unmatched by April 1975 when the production of the DS stopped for good. Yet the DS remained a unique automobile, its influence over the wider automobile industry somewhat limited as the pursuit of beauty and engineering ideals hardly pays the bills. The DS was a labor-intensive car to build, and bringing it to market required the costly development of proprietary technology. For the whole operation to be profitable, Citroën should have built at least 500 cars per day, but that's a figure it hardly achieved, even at the model's peak in the late 1960s. Properly replacing the DS would prove impossible even for Citroën itself, which lost its independence in 1974. The last car it developed on its own, the CX, enjoyed considerable market success, but it did not represent the technological and design leap the DS had been 20 years earlier. Personally, I've fallen in love with the DS when I was little. My dad owned a BX, and the local Citroën dealer had a few old DS lying around. Their shape captivated my imagination, fostering my enduring love for automobile design and engineering. 